Jennifer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Puckett. And so this is where my theatrical training yes. will come into play. <laughs> speak from the diaphragm. Wake everyone up here right after lunch. Uh, so anyway, hi. I work for a company called eModeration. And basically what our company does, uh, for the most part, with regards to kids, is that we are the people behind the scenes uh, at all the different social media and online communities, making sure that everyone is behaving themselves online. And if they're not, we tell our clients when they're not. We take action, sometimes banning them from the site, sometimes educating them into what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. Uh, and then also reporting on it back to our clients. Uh, I've also worked at places such as the Walt Disney Company. I was in charge of their online safety department there, setting up protocol, training documents, training people to do the same thing that I do now, uh, working with legal department, PR department, to just ensure that kids are behaving themselves online, but also that we are being responsible uh, business owners and taking responsibility for the actions that everyone takes online. That's awesome. Uh, Susan, walk us through who you are and what you do. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Susan Finley. I am an adjunct professor at Santa Monica College. I teach in the counseling department. And I'm also a doctoral candidate at Pepperdine University studying organizational leadership. Um, in addition to teaching at Santa Monica College, I'm a private consultant for social media networking. And I have experience working for the National School Safety Center with Dr. Ronald Stevens who um, is kind of the go-to man um, when, a school, um, uh, when a school shooting occurs. Um, so, did a lot of research with him. Very interesting. Tashaka, welcome. Tell us what you do. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Tashaka Armstrong. Uh, I'm the president of the nonprofit organization called Digital Shepherds. We go into schools. We work with parents. We work with teachers. Uh, we work with uh, various uh, groups to teach digital literacy, uh, to teach online uh, uh, safety, internet safety, uh, some media literacy training, and we really just work to show parents exactly how to utilize technology in their homes, parental controls on the computers. Very, uh, we're very practical, very down to earth, and very, um, we, we really dispel a lot of what the hard parts of learning tech are so that you really just get what you need to do to be able to uh, keep your home safe. And what news station do you work for? Oh, I work for Fox 11. I'm also, they call me the Tech Ninja. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> People remember it, so. He's on camera a lot. He has to distill uh, very advanced technology into a 20 second bit for on camera segments. So he's really good and he's a, he's a parent as well, which is kind of cool. So he wears a lot of hats. Yeah, I have an 18 and a 16 and a 14 year old. Power to you. That's awesome. Well, we're happy to have you here. Melissa. Well, I, I want to say that it's really nice to be here. And uh, I know that some of you are educators and parents. But you're here to learn about you know, how to protect your children and the children that you work with. And I just applaud you for that because there's so many parents that want to learn the information but do not take the steps to get there. I started Beyond Bullies in 2011. Um, I have in-school programs, I have online programs, and I have um, community awareness through workshops. And I would, I would say that ditto to everything that was just said, but there are a lot of kids and, and a lot of people in the community that will contact me by telling their stories or telling me what's happening. Um, when they're cyber bullied, and we have support in place to help them with, with being cyber bullied by, by walking them through the steps to make their um, experience safer and to make them feel better in the process. So let's start with what's working. Talk to us about what's working in combating cyber bullying and peer pressure. Jennifer, we'll start with you. Uh, great, thank you. So what we're seeing, and what I'm seeing quite a bit of, is that we're seeing a lot more adults and grown-ups and parents and teachers working with young people to create a dialogue. I think that's been said quite a bit today as well, is that really what's most important is that uh, adults realize that you don't know everything. And letting your kids know that isn't a bad thing. They know more about a lot about the technology than you do, but you know more about being polite and being smart and making the decisions. And so working together, knowing those kids, knowing what it is that, that they're doing online, 
being open to learning from them and, sh and, and walking through their world online with them, letting them show you what it is that they enjoy. That then shows them that you respect what they like, and it also gives them an opportunity to earn your trust and that they can also trust you to come to you when they're having a problem that they don't know how to solve. And we're seeing more and more of that, and I think that's really, really what's, what's important. Also, there are some great organizations, such as the one that Melissa is uh, responsible for, but also I just want to take a moment to mention a few others, like a Platform for Good, which works with FOSI. Uh, they work with schools and organizations across the country uh, to help build good programs and kids for, for kids to have any kind of charitable organizations within their school to do something good, whether it's recycling or combating online bullying. Uh, BeatBullying.org is similar to, uh, to Melissa's program as well. They have mentors and peers working with kids as well uh, so that the kids can have a safe space to talk with someone who's their same age about the problems that they're, that they're um, experiencing. Is that the site? BeatBullying.org. Beat. B-E-A-T. Bullying.org. The first one is a platform for good. Org, and they're not paying me, by the way. I just, yeah, no. I just love these. Yeah, I, just, I think they're really, 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 really important. And then the third one uh, is Lady Gaga's site with her mother born this way. Org, and that's really a really, really great organization for LGBTQ youth, who we know have some unique challenges as well in schools. Cool. Thank you. So that was what's working. Susan, walk us through uh, so what's working. Sure. Um, well, as an educator, my um, my thought is always that education is power. So in order to educate both students, staff, um, the community, law enforcement, you have to start early. And what's working is that in these situations, um, when there is a plan that's proposed as um, somewhat of um, a strategy prior to bullying, because we know that it's going to occur, um, we know that cyberbullying is going to occur, so if we can enact a strategy, a plan for when that actually happens, we'll be better prepared and um, more armed to um, deal with the situation as it comes up. Um, the other thing is, with younger adults, children, um, they don't always want to listen to adults. They don't always want to listen to their parents. They are more um, susceptible and accepting to listen to their peers. So uh, you had mentioned the cyber mentors. Um, that's a really great idea. And um, student liaisons, um, just getting the leaders of um, the community, leaders in the education system, everybody, um, you, you can kind of see student leaders in the school system and bring them on board. And then they become a go-to. Um, for students who are being bullied because they're more comfortable going to a fellow student sometimes than they are going to a professional, a teacher, a parent, um, staff member. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. To Shaka, what's, what are your, some of your tips to combat cyberbullying or peer pressure? Well, in, in addition to the great information that um, has already been presented, I'm going to add to that. Um, you're, it, it's difficult for children to come to us if we haven't already made deposits. And so having that plan in place prior to a bullying incident, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here because obviously you've shown up here, um, but creating a safe space, creating a safe place where our children can come speak to us when these events do occur, uh, finding out what makes them tick, what makes them work. Uh, for my daughter and I, it was uh, tea time. And so we created tea time as a safe space. So we'd go out, we'd do tea together, and she knew that when we did that, you know, th that was a, a space where if there was something that was a little sketchy and she needed to tell me, that at that time we were going to talk about it, we were going to work it out, figure it out, and that was a space where we could do that, where I wasn't going to fly off the handle. I'm actually kind of pretty even killed, so I don't generally fly off the handle. But, um, but she knew that that was, a, for her, that created a safe space. Uh, same with my sons, there are places where we can interact where they know that that's a safe space. So uh, making those deposits when they're young, uh, ahead of time, and I think being brutally honest with children. I think a lot of times we hold back. I always, when I'm speaking to men, I always tell dads that 
uh, if your daughter is a, a tween, if your sons are tweens, and you haven't had any conversations with them that have made you uncomfortable, you may not be having the right conversations. Mm -hmm. So if, if our children will trust us a lot more if they're getting information from us before they're getting it from their peers. Because we've all been through high school, we've all been through junior high, and we kind of have an idea of some of the things that go on in high school and junior high. So if you'll tell your child before they happen, that hey, you might experience some of these things and my daughter was that girl that developed ahead of everybody and so I let her know prior to junior high that as amazing and wonderful as she is, she was gonna be potentially popular but it wasn't necessarily for the reason she might think it would be. And so we had a very candid discussion about that. And what I told her was gonna happen, happened. So from that point forward, now we have a great uh, deal of trust. Because it's like, oh, my dad said this is gonna happen. It did happen. And so now she can come to me with things. Same with the sons. So I think if we're speaking to them early and we're brutally honest and, again, make those deposits, make a safe space, that'll help you with your peer pressure on your cyberbullying. Very helpful. That's great. Melissa, what are some tips to combat cyberbullying and peer pressure? I, you know, I think that it's kind of like cigarette smoking. When we heard the message that it was really bad through TV, through newspaper, through reading about it, through billboards, we got the message over and over and over again. We finally realized, hey, not only is it bad for you, but it's just not cool. So what is starting to happen is we're starting to have conversations about social media and cyberbullying and bullying. And we didn't have those conversations 10 years ago. So when I go to health fairs or I talk to parents, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I know about Facebook, I know about Snapchat, I know about Tumblr. And, and they know a lot of them are, have the information, yeah, when somebody's really mean to me, I ignore them. And so the information is getting out there slowly. And that's what's working, is that we're building a movement. And in order to change the behavior and turn it into positive social behavior, um, we, have to, we have to make it uncool, discoverable. Um, and that movement is starting. And that's what I think is working. That's very helpful. Thank you. All right, let's talk now about what's not working. It may have been working a few years ago where we thought that this is the approach and didn't get results. And if you want to, you're welcome to mention some tools, some tips. We've already mentioned a couple of them, but what's not working? And what are some tools and some tips to make it work? Uh, scare tactics. <laughs> Those don't work. Uh, telling them that it's the big bad web is not going to work. Um, Sorry, my notes here. Also, something that I just kind of want to—I want to take a moment to mention—is that Melissa touched on it as well. Is that bullying is not a new thing, and we have to remember that it's just much more visible now. And for some reason, having that visual of someone saying something bad makes it ten times, a hundred times more impactful to the person who is receiving. Uh, that being said, I think it's something that we need to take a step back as adults and remember that this is, this is part of growing up. Is it a good part of growing up? Absolutely not. Do we want to make it stop? Absolutely. But what we also need to do is realize that when we, as adults, make it something super, super scary, whether it's on the news all the time and it's just the most extreme cases, or it's your own child coming to you crying because they've, someone told them they were ugly, uh, whatever it is, having Having that hand slap way of looking at it is not going to work and hasn't. Uh, we used to think that filters, does anyone here know what a filter is? Filtering mechanism? Okay. A few people raised their hands. Um, I teach people what filters are all the time and I'll try to keep it brief. But basically this is the way that we used to and still try to do something technologically to keep people from saying bad things to other people. Essentially it works just like any other, kind of like a coffee filter, if you will. You have coffee grounds. And they go through the filter, well the coffee grounds are the bad stuff and they stay in the coffee machine and the good stuff comes out in the coffee pot, right? A technological filter works the same way. All the bad words stay up in the top with the grounds and the good words come out bottom and whatever you see on the front end is only good words, okay? Filters still work, right? We know that in some ways it's good to slap someone on the hand and say, no, you can't use the F-bomb. You know, you can't call someone a bad word or a bad name on, on sites, but people figure out ways around that, okay? Kids are very, very clever. We know that. They are excellent problem solvers, and if they want to do something, they're going to do it. So the best thing that I have found that works with technology and with filters is for us to be good, strong 
citizens ourselves and to follow our own rules. Don't, no, no more of this do as I say, not as I do, if you will. Don't get on a flame war and then tell, in a flame war and then tell your child not to do it themselves. Don't call someone a bad word and then not expect your child to use it. Very wise. That's, that's really good. Uh, Susan, walk us through some, some things in cyberbullying or peer pressure that are not working and some ways that we can make them work. Okay. Um, first off, there's, there's an importance to looking more closely at patterns of and determinants of cyberbullying rather than victimization. So um, human nature-wise, we look at the end result um, and then try to go backwards. What we're doing here that's working is that preparation, those finding the determinants, finding the, the behavior before it occurs, as it occurs, addressing it immediately. Um, I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but there are um, anonymous apps out right, from Silicon Valley. Um, Secret, Whisper, those are two examples. Um, and there are actually apps where people can post anything they want anonymously, so it's not going back to them. Um, that's becoming an issue. And also the phenomena of the disinhibition effect. And the disinhibition effect is essentially when you would write something and post something on a social media networking website that you wouldn't normally vocalize in a face-to-face -face interaction with another human being. So your inhibitions, in other words, are compromised in that situation. Um, so it's, again, um, I, really, I, I, I really agree with what Jennifer was saying. Um, it's, it's teaching the authorities, and then so it's like the trickle-down effect, and um, also starting early in the school, starting this education early. And, and what age? Uh, as early as they are able to understand bullying, because I know that um, many children already use um, apps. They have, they're able to use iPads, things like that. Um, they have an understanding of what social media is. How many, raise your hand if you think you should start at five. I mean, I just want to gauge. This is, there's no right answer, and there's no wrong answer today. You all are leaders in your space. Raise your hand if you should start at five. Bullying. I'm going to go down from there. Raise your, keep your hand up if you should start at four. Bullying. How about three? Bullying. Wow. Two. Okay, so we still have about five hands up. But at five, almost everyone raised their hand. Those of you in, in YouTube land, that's pretty crazy. Uh, okay, that's very, very yeah, helpful. Just a, a quick follow-up is that, yeah, the bullying, it's always there. It's just the medium has changed. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. now it's at, it's, it's at a larger scale where if you're being bullied, now it's on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And it's forever. And um, it's, ma it's reaching the masses. Mm -hmm. And um, that dissemination of information is going to be very difficult to remedy when you're being bullied. That's really wise. Bullying has not changed. The medium has. It ties into what Jennifer said, which bullying is not a new thing. It's just it's a lot more visible now, which I think is smart. Tashaka, what's what's not working in cyberbullying and peer pressure? Well, I, you know, I really will be to a degree echoing the sentiments, echoing, echoing what's really been already said, and that is that look, we already know that. In males, uh, the, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, the front of the brain, the part that's responsible for ambition, impulse control, isn't fully developed until around the age of 25. That hasn't changed, like I said. Not a lot has changed, other than the medium that the bullying is delivered. But I, I definitely agree that we have, we have to remove the phenomenon. This is not a phenomenon. You know, it is happening uh, in a way that makes it difficult for some children to get away from it. But often, Bullying begins on the schoolyard, it begins at school. It's not some magical unicorn that just appears online and all of a sudden somebody's been bullied. It's somebody didn't like the shoes somebody wore one day, somebody stepped on somebody's shoes one day. You know, it's, it's, it's things that have been going on since the first person stepped on somebody's shoes. So if we normalize this behavior in terms of, not saying that this is normal and you should be doing it, but that this is not this magical phenomenon, but that it is bullying. I mean, when I've talked to kids and asked them, I'll say, um, cyberbullying. 
if, if it's, it's a ridiculous term in that if I rode your bus home with you every day on your school bus and I bullied you on the bus, I beat you up on the bus, where well, they start calling this bus bully. And all the kids laugh because they get the ridiculousness of the concept. So if we just include this with bullying, that if there are these behaviors that you can engage in that hurt uh, people, that, that uh, damage people, uh, and you may have been the person that's been the victim and now you're doing it to other people. If we can actually, again, normalize that and, and remove this, the phenomenon from it, I, I see that that tends to be very effective. And also, uh, with children, allowing them to have ownership of the results, uh, ownership of, of fixing the problem. They're a lot smarter than sometimes maybe we give them credit for. And, and I've been involved in some programs where I've watched uh, some PhDs sit down and have rooms full of young children talk about the cyberbullying and the bullying issues going on in their schools. And these kids came out, they talked, they cried, they apologized to each other. I mean, it would have made an amazing reality show. Uh, it was just incredible, it was riveting, but it was uplifting to watch children resolve their own issues. And they really can, but you have to uh, get them in a space where they're no longer uh, gonna laugh at the other person, where there's, there, you, you really have to create the space and help them create the space. But once you do, uh, given the right circumstances, they take off and they will own it and they'll resolve it. And, and so I think we're, we as a parent are trying to jump in and solve everything initially, or again, being afraid the sky is falling, fear, uncertainty, doubt, uh, that's an internet acronym, you can use that now. Uh, if, if we get away from that and actually give people information and allow them to own it, uh, it's much more effective. That's fun. F-U-D. F-U-D. Fear, fear uncertainty. uncertainty, doubt. Great. Melissa, walk us through some uh, combat, some cyberbullying and peer pressure tips that may not have worked before and, and how you're using them in your program. Well, I want to say that technology is outpacing laws, okay? So with that said, there's, there's, there's two tiers to that. One is we can't expect schools, if the majority of our schools, or the majority of states in our country have cyberbullying laws, can't expect as parents or educators that those laws are going to be implemented. You know, they may be mandated, but they're not going to be necessarily implemented. So, as educators and parents, it is your job to advocate for those laws to be mandated, for there to be specific consequences for cyberbullying being um, being used outside outside of school, to and from school, while you're at school. So it's one thing for our school to say, yes, we have anti-bullying policies, but it's another if it's not being implemented properly. Um, and the onus will fall on all of you um, to help in that process. Um, the other thing I want to say about that is what's not working is you cannot say to your son, if you're, if you're bullying somebody, I'm going to take away your internet privileges. And that's it. You know, because that is one of the worst things that you can say to someone because what you're saying basically is you're putting fear into them and, and that's another way of making making somebody not want to tell you if they're being sour bullied. And if nothing else is conveyed by me today, and what I do convey in my workshops with parents is it's really important to, to gain the trust of your child. Having conversations about like, so, um, did you see the new, uh, did you see that something was trending on, on Twitter? You know, I mean, I just had to think about that. Like, that's not natural for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it's like, um, but, you know, obviously it's become part of my vocabulary, you know? I can talk to my, my niece and my nephews, and, but I'm, I'm entering their world, you know? So, it's not like I have to know like, if you go into this message place in Tumblr, then you can have a private chat with somebody. But I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the leap into their world and ask them questions about it. And um, instead of, like, feeling like, oh my god, I'm so technologically overwhelmed. There's so much on my plate. Um, so what's not working is 
being overwhelmed and not, not diving into it. What is working is at least learning some of the language and not being so afraid of your son or daughter or your student um, and using tactics like taking away internet privileges um, as a last resort because you do not know how to handle um, the situation at hand. I think what is not working is um, not setting certain consequences for behavior. If somebody is sending out a mean note, if somebody is saying something unkind, um, that you just let it go. I think it's important that you say, you need to go up to so-and-so and apologize. You know, so that, so that student or your child learns like, that it takes a certain amount of humiliation to have to like own up to what you've done. Um, there are a lot of, what also in my program, I teach different strategies on how to combat cyberbullying. And, you know, one on a slight level might be ignoring it, but ignoring bullying um, is also sending the wrong message. It's also to some looking like you're supporting the bully. Um, so in my program, I say, try to find a statement that will not put you in harm's way, um, that, will, that will help at, or, or go up to the person who's being bullied afterwards. So what's not working is just saying, just ignore it. And also what's not working is, if somebody isn't being bullied because they're lucky, because they happen to look a certain way, or because they happen to fit in, doesn't mean you shouldn't be having the conversation. Not focusing on compassion and empathy towards the types of people who get stereotypically bullied, because there are people who are gonna get bullied more so than others. Um, just because your student or your son or daughter doesn't fit those stereotypes does not mean you should not be having those conversations about building empathy and compassion towards people with developmental disabilities, to people who may be overweight, to somebody who is, you know, got some type of neurological disorder. Um, I think that it's never too late to, em to emphasize and to empathize um, differences and to embrace them. Very good point. I was on a radio show yesterday with um, somebody interesting, and they were interviewing us about Safe Smart Social and this new initiative I'm dedicating my 2014 year to. And they said, well, Josh, this is interesting, because I, the radio host, she's a mom of two kids. She said, you know, and I want to quote her, uh, she said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And she said, Josh, that's not true anymore, because now they do. And we explained this morning that when I ran for politics, I was cyberbullied, and it really hurt my feelings as a 30-year-old adult. And my team right now advises, uh, we're doing a political type of thing, where I'm actually being cyberbullied as we speak. Mm -hmm. And I'm explaining to my team at the office, we will not, it's don't take it personally, it means you're winning. I'm showing, <laughs> and it, it, it really does, it means they have no other option but to personally attack me, they can't, run their political race, and we're being clean, we're not responding. Now, I like what Melissa said, not responding sometimes means they win. It's a different every time, but by responding in a negative way, and remember what I told you this morning, as I was racing uh, for my political race in Hermosa Beach, if I would have responded negatively, I would have lost a tremendous amount of votes. But by responding in a positive way, that I was proud of 10 years later, I was able to get even more votes. People said, wow, you're really nice in the public debate, and I'm doing the same thing now. It is not easy to be, have someone critically come after you personally, but I think the key here, and I really like uh, some of the things you've written down, is when you have a dialogue with your kids, and you're listening to them, and you're talking their talk, as Melissa said, hey, did you notice this was trending? I really like that. I like what Toshaka was saying about tea time. He's actually downplaying something that's really amazing. He's trying to do a national tea time where daddies talk to their daughters over something really, really cool. What is the name of the website? Uh, well, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, it's the National Daddy Daughter Tea. It's actually international uh, now. Uh, but if you if you search it out on Facebook, and even if you type in, if you go to Google and type in National Daddy Daughter Tea, will be some of the first uh, some of the first results that uh, come up. And so once a year, we encourage men, and this is partially because of what was happening on the web, 
Um, I've worked in investigative journalism for a number of years, and so when a lot of this stuff was first happening with MySpace and all that, I noticed that it was primarily young ladies that were being victimized on the web. And so, and a lot of the young ladies were also engaging in attention seeking behaviors. Yeah. And so I knew that if dads were able to communicate the value that their daughters had, that they wouldn't go doing these things um, online to get that attention. So uh, we're the, a goal eventually is to get a presidential proclamation uh, one day a year is, is National Dad and Daughter Day, and we really encourage men to make those connections so that we're not seeing young ladies putting themselves out there like they have uh, been. Uh, so, you know, because we have role models like uh, Kardashians and, yeah. and stuff. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's tough. They, they yeah, see it. That's, it's in the media in their face all the time. See how engaged you all are? And uh, with kids, when you use examples from the media, they perk up too, and all of a sudden it makes sense. Try that. In my limited experience talking to kids, I've used all, I've tried almost 100 examples, and the Miley Cyrus one gets a laugh. The kids go, yep, twerking. <laughs> it's sad, but it's true. So there's just a little tiny tip. They'll, they'll tend to do that. All right, I want to open it up to some Q&A right now. And this is, remember, we'll keep it somewhat light, bright, and polite. So if you have an example, keep the people's names out of it, if you could, because we're on YouTube. And I don't want to get an email saying, take the video down, because it could keep other educators from learning from this. So what, what questions do you have? Yes, over here on the right. Yeah, I think that uh, all of you guys are amazing. I was telling Josh that this, this uh, media that we're using right now, you guys coming up and speak has been amazing for me, probably the best. Workshop or conference I've been to, but one of the, I work at a school. I'm an assistant principal at a middle school, and I think I, I believe that one of the key things that we should be doing first is to define bullying. I mean, if you look, if you go into school, they have you know the parents have one definition of it, kids have one definition, teachers have others, and administrators have others. And the goal would be as a district or as a school or any entity that works with kids is to define it and have one definition where everybody can understand it, and then we grow from that. And that's what I found in my 17-year career working at, in schools, is that uh, there isn't just one definition. And kids and parents, uh, you know, it, go, it comes from home and it comes onto the schoolyard, yeah. but if they can't find it or they cannot uh, see it because they don't know what bullying well, is. We're gonna tactically define that right now. What is your school's def definition of bullying? Well, you know, we have one that we use, and it's very simple. It, it, you know, bullying is a repeat act. So if a kid comes up to somebody and says you're ugly, that's not bullying, that's being a mean person, right? That's a mean word, that's how we define it. So bullying is something that goes on, so if it's, if it's something where a kid is, let's say for example, in the, and here's an example, in the PE locker room, and there's another kid that bumps into a kid over and over and over again, and you know, that's, that's an act of bullying. But what we tell our kids is we're teaching them resiliency, is how to stand up for themselves. There should be one step before it comes to some, some adult. The kids say, hey, that, you know, that doesn't make me feel good, don't do it, stop it, is what we use, we use stop it. And we tell the kids to talk to the other person and let them have a reaction to it of what they're doing. That, because you've got to educate both. You have to educate the kid that's being the victim, you also got to educate the bully. You can't just attack the bully, right? That person has had issues at some point. You've got to educate them and make them understand that what they're doing is wrong. So we have our kids stand up to the kid and learn resiliency. That's one of the part of our definition of bullying is to teach resiliency. And then, once they do that, you, and they get the bully, if the person continues to have that behavior, now you're you are verbally telling the bully or the person that you have stepped over line, now I'm gonna look for help. So we've eliminated what it is to snitch. You know the word, the kids you snitch, I don't wanna be a rat, I don't wanna tell, it's gonna be worse. If I verbally tell you, that's verbal documentation is what we tell our kids. They, I've already said, stop it. I told you it didn't make me feel good, or that I don't want you to do that. And the kid continues. Then they seek a trusted adult, a safe, a safe place, a safe place, a person where they can discuss it. So for us, it's very simple. We, we made it child friendly. If an act uh, is repeated and it's, it's, it's uh, hurting you verbally, physically, psychologically, or emotionally, and it's and you have stood up to it with resiliency, then we, we uh, deem it as being bullied. That's a good definition. Thank you very much. Yes, over here. I add that, so I work in the middle school too, and we define it as um, a repeated act with intent to harm where there's an imbalance of power. So meaning that the person who is 
coming at you is older than you, bigger than you, or a group of people. So that helps them define it as well. So if we have it fall under those three different categories. And that's repeated act with intent to harm. Uh, and an imbalance of power. An imbalance of power. Okay. Of power over the people. That's great. So and the power could be social clout too. You know, so it could be the person is, maybe it's two eighth graders, but the one eighth grader has more social clout. So it doesn't necessarily have to be bigger. You know it when you see it. Yeah, yeah. In the back, yes. Yes, uh, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Armstrong. Um, I would just like to use an example. I don't want, like, like he said, to pull out names or anything, but let's say this kid's named Steven, and he comes up to me with, with confidence that he's being bullied, but yet he's not comfortable out, like, fully to tell me everything that's going on, like, who's the person, what he, had, what he has done, and how many times, or, like, how's it going? Mm -hmm. But I, but I try to generate that comfort zone where he knows it's only me and him, it's not going to be, I'm going to have to go to the authority or parents or anything. How can I establish and gain his trust so he could full on tell me everything that, that he feels comfortable saying without me urging him or forcing him to, to complete by it? Uh, listening. And so with some children, uh, my own son was bullied in, in middle school. And uh, uh, he's very, he's boisterous. He'll, he may grow up to be a comedian. I'm trying to get him to do But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, at first, when he was going through it, he didn't really want to talk about everything that was going on. And, and I think what the best you can do is, unless you see some physical signs where you have to urge him or where you have to really kind of get involved uh, immediately, is to, to listen. Uh, when they feel like they can t uh, trust you, when they feel like they can talk to you, and there's no immediate consequence of now all of a sudden there's other teachers coming up to me asking me questions, or an administrator, a dean is now involved, then they then you know, oh, I can trust this person, I can talk to them, they didn't, t they didn't share the secret, they didn't go around and telling people. So it's just being consistent and being trustworthy. And then, again, then once they do begin to open up, then you can, you're able to diagnose if it's something that maybe you should take greater involvement in at that point. Uh, uh, again, where, where there's no physical signs of, of danger uh, already appearing. But it, it's tough because they don't want to talk. Because it's being bullied is, it, 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 if you allow yourself to be a victim, it really steals your power. And it really makes you feel powerless. Uh, makes you feel bad about yourself. Um, and, and, and so it's very difficult for some children to come out and basically say, I feel like garbage, you know, I feel, so best we can do is, is, is really just listen and be supportive. Um, well, too, is, is Speaker that, Oh, sorry, I was just, I didn't want to interject too loud right away. The other thing I was just going to say is sometimes it just takes time. Mm -hmm. It may, it may take him five or six or seven visits, but he's coming back to tell you a little bit more or a little bit more, and, and, and having that calm demeanor. Um, Shaka and I were talking a little bit earlier, too, is sometimes what can be so difficult for adults is when you do finally get to the root of it, not having that immediate gut reaction where you want to freak out. Because we're, we're human, too, and the things that children do to each other, the things that adults do to each other, is horrible. And, and your first reaction, if it's, <gasps> you know, something really, really shocking, that, that, of course, sends a message as well. So having that calm demeanor, listening, as Shaka said, to the child, noticing if he comes back more and more, giving you a little bit more information, as you're earning his trust. And you'll see that after a while, he may come to you and say something that you really weren't even expecting. But knowing that he's trusted you then eventually, and then taking that information as adults, teachers, parents, not, uh, not, not having that first gut reaction, at least not trying to contain it as best as possible. Go ahead and freak out when you're alone later <laughs> on. I've done that many times. Just not doing it at them so that they know that they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be looked at as weird, you know, or freakish or whatever it is, or however they're feeling, weak. Um, you know, and, and even just saying to them, being honest, is what we keep talking about, being honest with, with the kids. And say, well, that's, you know, I'm feeling shocked for you, too. 
letting them, you know, acknowledging their feelings, acknowledging all of that is, is a really huge step towards letting them know, again, that you are a safe space and that they can trust you and they'll come to you more and more. I just want to add to that. I think that Chaka and Jennifer, you know, made really good points. But if there's a policy in place at your school and if somebody does tell on a student that's being bullied, they're going to be afraid maybe they're going to be retaliated against. Yeah. So what protections are in place? You know, if that person, if the kid is afraid that these bullies are going to like kill him or, you know, trump all over him, how can you reassure him that it's going to be taken care of? You know, do you have the support from the administrators? Does the kid have a family, you know, that will, that will, you know, back him up? I mean, I would try to get some more information and, um, see what type of safe environment and what, what you can really offer the student. No, I'm sorry, one more thing. Along the lines of listening to the, to the child, um, and this is also great marital advice too, uh, listen <laughs> and don't listen to rebut or listen to fix. I know personally that's still something that I work with all the time, mm -hmm. is not listening to fix, but listen to understand. Because sometimes we forget what it was like to be in their shoes, or we forget what it was like to be a middle schooler or a high schooler. So if you'll if you'll kind of uh, throw out some of those adult things we do, and just really just listen to understand instead of okay, he just said this, I know I can fix that, but you know, just really just be there present and not trying to immediately fix it, but empathize and understand. What they're doing. Yeah. Um, I think that it's it's really important to have this conversation before the, a student comes to you. So in other words, um, role play would be an excellent example in educating students, faculty, staff, in having um, a dialogue and a role play. It's like practice, like anything. You don't pick up an instrument and immediately know how to play it. If you have practice with it, then when the situation arises, you're more prepared, you are able to um, approach it in a calm manner and I know that I'm not sure about the elementary level but at Santa Monica College we have a safety training online program that students can do and they essentially learn how to interact with students and how to help fellow classmates who um, are going through psychological distress and there are also, um, which I'll provide for you, but there are safety trainings for parents, educators, um, staff, and they're all online, and many of them are free, so. That's good to know. I also learned something many years ago from Dale Carnegie. The book, one of the most famous books from 1901 to 1999 was how to win friends and influence people. Uh -huh. And I read it when I was really young, four times. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I've learned, because I have a big, Tashaka, you and I are uh, similar, I have a big problem, not just wanting to get right to the point, like, oh, so you mean this, let's just, let's just go, I get it. But rather, I try and repeat back what they told me, because I have a problem thinking I know what they thought, but really when I repeat it back, they're like, no, that's not what I mean at all, you idiot. <laughs> so that's what I've found, is kids are like, this is what I'm saying to you, so you're saying this, and if I just try and repeat it back, then they can say if I'm right or wrong. That's more of a human nature trick for me, but I, Dale Carnegie taught me that, it's kind of fun. <laughs> can I repeat back some of the stuff? Oh, yes, go ahead. So I, I work at a high school, um, and I kind of like a double question. Mostly I'm dealing with the anonymous aspect that was is the killer. Mm -hmm. um, we also had uh, Twitter, feeds that were going through a, a, a Twitter name that was the name of our high school and then anyone could upload tweets and Twitter actually took it down and they were really good about monitoring asking. We have no luck with that. Yeah. So uh, everything you were saying about being proactive and having role playing and, and you know education beforehand, absolutely. But in the meantime, you know, I had a student come to me yesterday, people were um, commenting on Ask FM about him, and it was just killing him inside, and he just broke down in my office, hadn't told his parents, um, allowed, gave me permission to call and talk to them, which was great. I, I want to know if, and, and maybe, if, I don't know if I'm talking to Susan or all of you here, some tools that, some, some things that I could say to him in that moment, because it's anonymous, and that was the part I think that hurt him the most, was that he doesn't know who it is. He doesn't know who he can 
not necessarily confront, but address this with, or how he even start a conversation, because he has no idea who it is. All I could do in the moment was try to, you know, empathize with him and say, agree with him, yes, this sucks, absolutely. Um, and you can't respond because it's anonymous. So what I said to him, and I hope this is going to work for him, was stop reading them because you have no idea where it's coming from. And if someone comments on it to you, you can say, oh, really? I haven't even read them. I didn't even know. Pretend that you don't know about this because if it gets back to the person then and they realize they're not having an effect on you, then maybe they'll quit because the whole point is to have an effect. But in that moment, I, I want, you know, the magic words that I can say to this 16-year-old boy, this tough kid. Who let, me ask, let me ask a question. Did you tell the kid to get off the app? What did you tell him? Yeah, I told him, yes. Okay. I said, you're, you're never going to get anything good from this app. Okay. And what I did say was, before you delete it, show your parents. Because they're going to want to know, because they had no idea what it was when I called them. What do you, what do you guys say to that situation? Go ahead. I think she asked Susan first. I think um, from a psychological perspective, I would validate their feelings. Um, first off, normalize that their feelings are um, proportionate to the actual incident. So say, you know, I, I understand or using the empathy, create a safe environment, focus on the I as opposed to you, let them know that they we're not responsible, it is a victimization. It's something that you could come in with your own experience because regardless of whether you were ever, you know, the, the medium that was used, everyone has experience, whether personally or um, seeing it occur with bullying. So if you keep it on the eye, like from my experience, this has happened, that will allow the student to offer up more information. It will draw out more information when you focus on yourself and what you have experienced rather than saying you could do this, you should have done that, um, and just creating a safe environment for them to offer up more information. A counselor or psychologist should definitely be recommended in that situation. I was also just going to add to that, absolutely excellent, excellent advice. Um, the other thing is, that, and I've used this with some folks that, believe it or not, I've had to experience bullying and, and kids picking on each other, adults picking on each other where I work. And I've had some of my team members come to me and say that they've been, they've experienced harassment. I mean, they've used the word harassment, it's bullying. The other thing that I like to say, and when I used to work with kids as well, tweens and teens, and they would come to me um, and only knew me as an online um, personality character. But I would say to them, you know, there's always going to be bullies on the playing field. Always. Always. They're always going to be there. You're, but you have the choice as to whether or not you're going to let them bother you. You know, does it hurt? And again, like she said, validate their feelings. It is horrible what these people say to each other. It's horrible what was said to you. Absolutely. But Quite frankly, there's really, the best thing you can do is to just ignore it. Or not, not ignore it, I'm sorry, but delete the app, like you said. There's never going to be any solution to that. There's always going to be bullies on the playing field. Don't let them get into you that way. You know, l allow them to have those feelings. Agree with them that those feelings are validated. And then just realize, help them realize that it's, just, it's, it's going to be part of their life. And they can choose to allow it inside or to um, move forward. I liked your technique of telling them that you don't know. When I was really young, my dad taught me something. We got our house teepeed. And I was going to school the next day, and I told this, this kid, one of the kids said, so how was your weekend at school? And somebody asked, did you get teepeed? I was like, I don't think so, why? No, I don't think so. Well, yeah, we heard that you got teepeed. My parents must have cleaned it up before I got up. I don't even know. And I faked that and never got teepeed again because I acted like it didn't even affect me. Yeah. It wasn't a big deal, right? The reason I answer it, were you guys here for this morning, the, the 10 hottest apps? Mm -hmm. yes. 
we're finding that if we tell a kid, hey, it's, you're on Ask FM, sorry that you're experiencing this, this is really terrible, and you need to go about your way to do this the right way, then we go, hey, are you on Facebook? Have you thought of just spending more time on an app that has good? Ask FM, sorry to blanket it right now, but I work in the tech space and I see thousands of kids every quarter. There's nothing good that has ever come out. If I need to say that again, I will. Yeah. Nothing good comes out of Ask.FM. At all. No kid goes, I was inspired to paint a painting and make a painting. <laughs> it's sad. There's nothing good that comes out of these. We can that will help you in your particular situation. But again, yes, bullies are always going to be on the playing field. And the internet is, in some ways, a big, fat playing field for people. And, and so, again, as I said before, the best, you know, some of the best ways in which we can help educate young people and help them to become more confident human beings and responsible digital citizens is by leading by example, really. You get bullied or you get you know, slammed on your Twitter feed, walk away or do, do not become involved. Do not let them get you involved and start slamming them back. Right. You know, it's called a flame war, right? I don't know if anyone's heard of a flame war before. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it's some, one of those things where that's really, it's, it's really best to lead by example because it's gonna take a really long time for the internet to clean up, if it ever will. Well, I, I, I want to say that also context is king, and if we look at the internet as basically a megaphone, because that's really all it really does is it amplifies uh, negative or positive. Uh, most of the memes that go across your Facebook feeds all come from probably like two or three sites, Reddit, 9, Gag, 4chan. Uh, they really everything comes, uh, it's, you could go there on any given day and see everything on Facebook, Twitter, and everything, it's really silly. But we have to keep that in context that a small group of people, even when a child is being bullied, those anonymous messages, they may seem like 30 people are sending it, and maybe one or two people. Okay. And so we have to keep in mind that, that people don't tend on the internet to, to voice how happy they are with a service or a thing. If you go to Sprint's web page, or their Facebook fan page, you're not gonna see hundreds of comments on their page that say, I love you guys, you're amazing. You might see hundreds of comments that say, I'm not getting service, there's a hole here, there's a, you know, so people tend to voice when they're dissatisfied with something, yell negative reviews on a restaurant, people tend to, you know, voice when they're dissatisfied. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking to children as well, help them and give them, help them with that perspective as well. That it may feel like there's this mountain of negative sentiment coming their way, when really it may only be, you know, one or two people. Okay, we're gonna take two more and then we're gonna have to wrap it up because we're going over if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah, you know, our, our conversation reminds me of this movie that my dad told me to watch a long, long time ago called The Invention of Lying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it, but yes. it was like nobody would lie. You know, it was everybody would tell the truth and then somebody realized they found out one person lied and then it just went, you know, worldwide, right? <laughs> so I, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about, and there's a lot of research, we've read books on bullying and how it, what it looks like how it affects people, I, but, but one of the things that, that I would like to see uh, is the prevention of bullying in schools or with kids, talking about solutions in the sense of, okay, so this kid is nervous, he doesn't want to say that he's been picked on because of retaliation, but if, so here's an example. When you have a, an individual that, that is you know, smoking cigarettes or, or on drugs or with you know, alcoholism, you have the AA group, or you have some other groups that can help that person feel, speak to other people that have dealt with it, and then change those behaviors. So, we talk about in education, you know, we, we're relentless in teaching how to read in kindergarten. By first grade, they have to read. You know, we're relentless in teaching the kids how to do mathematics. Why aren't we relentless in teaching kids how to behave and expectations how to be good every single day so they get it? Because we do everything else, but let's teach how to be good and be a good person. So then when they grow up, they can teach that to their kids. And then you have this trend where people are just being good people. I, I, I'd like to see that. Cool. Yes, in the back, one more. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, a, a disclaimer, I wrote with Jennifer on the moderation team. Um, and I think especially for the younger kids, there's a lot of people that are popular and, you know, I would advise parents, teachers, find out what the policy is of the sites your kids are going to. Is there a goal moderation? How often is the site moderated? You know, if they're really, really small, you know, obviously it's better if they're on the moderated sites. 
Um, and that's one of the things that, that parents should be aware of in, in, in learning about the worlds their children are hanging out in. That's the policy. Do they know how to make a report if they're getting bullied? Do they know how to do that on that site? Because most sites allow for that to be done. And those are really good things to know about for your kids and for you. Susan, you want to wrap it up? Sure. Um, I just wanted to, to add um, I, I, what Laura was asking. Um, so bad things happen to good people. And the way that you would overcome it and the way that we can overcome those things is to put value on what has happened. So when a child is bullied or an adult for that matter, um, they feel a lack of power. So the ultimate would be empowerment of that individual. And in empowering the individual would be able to say, hey, this happened to you, how can you help others? How can you help others with this particular experience? And it just, it brings me back to um, one of my favorite quotes, and I wrote it down because I, I know I would mess it up if I didn't, but um, Dr. Martin Luther King, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do bad things, but because all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. So um, I think that it is a responsibility of if you see it happening, um, teach the children not only the ones being bullied, not only the victims, not only the perpetrators, but the ones that are observing to know where to go. Facebook does have a, sa a center, safety center. Um, YouTube has a health center. All of these social media websites, they have a health center and a safety center. It's just they're not as visible as we would like them to be. Safety. This is really helpful. Remember, at the bottom of this, you've got a little sweepstakes. We'd love to know your favorite tips from today. We're listening on Twitter, and then we're going to give away that device later today to one of you, that neat uh, note. What is it that you have? Note 3. Galaxy, Galaxy Note 3 brought to you by Sprint. Sprint's not here anymore, but we're giving away a Note 3 at the end of the day to the best tweet. Let's give a round of applause for these.